Hello, uh, my name is Patrick McDaniel. I am a uh, professor at Penn State University and I've been working on smartphone security for a little over a decade. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what's possible um, uh, uh, in terms of taking a look at, 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 at smartphone applications and evaluating them for security and, and uh, safety properties. Uh, and I'm really going to do that through a historical context. So let me pull up the slides here. Um, so I think the best way to begin a discussion like this is to talk about uh, sort of the evolution of smartphones. So, you know, smartphones have been around for a little over 10 years, um, but there was an event actually in the summer of 2010 that was sort of uh, uh, instructive. So um, this is actually a, a smartphone application. Uh, you can't really see it uh, because it's doing something interesting. But um, in 2010, uh, there was... Uh, some security researchers had looked at an application and found that uh, a particular application was grabbing information, uh, personal identifying information, and sending it to a foreign country. Um, and uh, the internet being what it was, people sort of freaked out and, and uh, decided that uh, you know, this was an entirely malicious application. Um, it got pulled from the, the uh, uh, Google market, uh, Google Play market. Uh, they did an evaluation, and in the end, uh, they discovered that, you know, it wasn't really that malicious of an application. It just turned out that uh, the application itself um, had made some poor design decisions about collecting information and using that to create a pseudo identity. But the larger problem here is, is not really that this application, which it turned out to be just a, a desktop uh, uh, image application, it would simply just change the images on the, on the desktop. Um, but it was because really that the application had those rights to begin with. And this sort of brought into, into, uh, into the light the fact that, you know, often applications can ask for a lot of permissions um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't really need those permissions for its critical tasks, but it uses, uh, has the potential to misuse those, um, uh, particularly if an application is uh, uh, malicious. And so, you know, starting really at the very dawn of, of, of smartphones and, and, and thereafter, we've really been trying different methods to develop different tools for doing different kinds of analysis of analyses of these, of these applications. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk you through a couple of these, um, uh, 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 these tools to give you a sense of kind of uh, what kind of tools are out there. Um, as well as uh, give you, maybe give you some inspiration for doing some new and interesting kinds of analyses. Uh, so um, I'm an academic, um, and a lot of the deeper anal analysis tools actually comes from the academy. So I'm really going to concentrate on four tools um, that, uh, that we developed as, as part of our, our, our security research in smartphones. Um, and then I'm, in the end, I'll talk about a few more uh, and, and really kind of with the broad uh, uh, collection of tools that are available. And perhaps uh, you, know, you can get your hands on some of these tools and some of the other tools that other folks in the academic community uh, have, have built to do your own analysis. Uh, but, but before I begin, it's really important to take a step back. Now, when I'm talking about smartphone analysis, everything I'm going to talk about today um, it relates to uh, Android because uh, one of the nice advantages of, of Android is it's in an open platform. Um, and it turns out that that openness has driven an entire economy of academics to uh, study uh, and make better the Android operating system. So there's some debate about whether or not um, uh, things like iOS are better because it's a closed system and there's so little information and so little access. Um, I think it's probably arguable that, uh, that in the long, perhaps in the short term, Apple may uh, be better served. Um, but in the long term, having an army of academics and students and graduate students um, basically making Android better and more secure is probably uh, a better long term model for the security of the platform. Um, but to think about Android, it's really just embedded Linux. Um, so, you know, it's a Unix system on a uh, which was originally a low power device, modern, op or, uh, modern phones are very powerful indeed. Um, but it's embedded Linux with a middleware layer called Binder. Um, um, and it has a runtime environment uh, uh, in which your applications are gonna run. So that runtime environment uh, was originally called Dalvik. It's a Dalvik virtual machine. Um, and your applications are basically uh, Java uh, applications running on a special version of, of, 
a, a, a virtual machine called Dalvik, um, and then more recently, uh, the Android runtime system, which is a replacement for Dalvik. But for the purposes of the discussion today, Arts and Dalvik are, are really essentially the same thing. Now, applications are really a set of software components. I'm sure many of you have actually done a, a development in this space. But what's important is these components are, are software uh, modules that, um, uh, that, you're, that create an application. There's background tasks, there's uh, user interface tasks, there are sort of database tasks. Um, there are also things called the uh, intents, and intents are really just the IPC, inter-process communication, inter-application communication. And it's the intents that will really allow the system to communicate uh, 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 to, uh, between applications and, and between the systems and the applications themselves. Um, now, what drives security in this space is really permissions. So, so permissions, and I'll get into this a little bit uh, 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 in a moment, but permissions are really just the rights that are given to applications. So there are some permissions which are given uh, automatically. Uh, there are some permissions that uh, the user is asked uh, uh, during installation um, uh, for, uh, basically when you install an application and it says, hey, do you, do you allow these rights? Uh, that is, that uh, gives the application to use those permissions. Now, permissions are lots of different things, and we'll talk about those in just a second. Now, what's interesting about smartphones, the smartphones um, really drove probably one of the largest changes in software economy in the history of computing, and that's a move from uh, sort of getting your applications from bricks and mortars, you know, you used to go to a bookstore and get a box for software and then download it from, from the internet uh, more recently, but the application markets were, that were driven by smartphones changed the entire economy. Um, now, there's a misconception by some, maybe not everyone, but this misconception is, is that when you receive an application it's from a market, it's actually secure. And the answer to that question is no, that's not necessarily true. Um, application markets really don't have the context to decide what is secure. They can look for overtly malicious behavior. They can look for bot behavior. They can look for, um, uh, you know, uh, exfiltration of data kinds of behaviors. But security is a much broader thing. Security is really contextual. And so it's impossible to really know if an application is, is truly secure. So what we found ourselves in, 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 in the broader community is that as uh, an application becomes critical to an enterprise, they need to develop new kinds of analyses that are specific to the kinds of security requirements of that environment. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a reference here at the bottom of the screen uh, of a column that, uh, that uh, myself and one of my students wrote about really what the, 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 ec the economics of markets are and why um, and what, how that connects with security. So uh, for those of you who have taken some security uh, uh, courses, Android is a kind of classical mandatory access control. You basically have a system policy that you nail up, which is enforced by this middleware layer uh, called Binder. Um, and uh, uh, per, uh, an application is allowed to access a component or a, 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 an interface or a device uh, if it's been given the permission uh, to, to do so. So what are the kinds of permissions? Well, the permissions are things like location, um, and there's really kind of two of those. There's fine location and course location, which really access to GPS. Uh, phone identifiers, that's like phone number, um, uh, the MZ, the, MZ uh, the, the hardware identifiers for a cellular phone, uh, the microphone, the camera, the address book, um, SMS, the ability to use uh, text messaging. And then of course, applications can extend the permission system. You can define your own permissions um, uh, uh, in, in the system. Now the security is defined by all of the decisions, all of the applications on your phone, um, as well as all the decisions that are made by a user. Now it's worth noting that uh, as of uh, Build 23 Marshmallow, Android introduced some um, uh, more discretionary access control, basically runtime recoverable, uh, revocable uh, user decisions, which basically uh, gets us a little closer to classical Mac and a little bit closer to some of the things they're doing in iOS. So that is just kind of a setup. Um, so September 23rd, 2008. So in September 23rd, 2008, uh, um, Android 1.0 comes out. Um, and we as a community uh, began to take a look and say, well, we know that these platforms are going to be the next big thing in computing. How do we evaluate the security of them? Um, and so in 2000, in late in uh, spring of 2008, um, we took a step back and said, okay, well, you know, what are the kinds of questions we want to ask 
about security for a particular application. And certainly in the early days, in, in, in fall of 2008 and into 2009, the first real question was, are the permissions that applications are asking for legit? Are they dangerous? Um, and we, <laughs> excuse me, we uh, built a system called Keyren. Essentially, Keyren is, is really just a tool. It's actually a replacement for the installer. Um, and the tool itself was perhaps a little antiquated, but, but the, the, the real interesting part about Keyren was that at application installation time, it asked some interesting questions about what permissions an actual application was asking for. And so that set of permissions uh, 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 could potentially be dangerous. And, and there's a paper at the bottom of the screen here, if you're interested. Um, so Kieran uh, uh, basically says, oh, we're gonna look at the set of permissions that uh, a particular application is requesting. So in Android, uh, you define, uh, as the developer, you define the set of permissions you're gonna ask for. And at runtime, uh, if those for certain kinds of permissions, uh, if those are deemed sensitive enough, the user is asked. And you'll see if we've all seen the screen that says, oh, uh, this application is asked for these permissions, uh, yes or no. Of course, the answer is always yes, um, which is an entirely different discussion about usability. Um, but that set of permissions that they've asked for has some interesting security implications. So, so let's think about this for a second. What is what would a dangerous set of permissions look like? Well, so here at the bottom we have something called a, 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 a set of permissions and uh, actions that are uh, occurring in a phone. So, if we have an application that asks asks, asks for access find location in the internet, uh, and that's really GPS coordinates and the ability to use uh, the network, um, and it receives something called boot complete. Now, boot complete is a, uh, an intent that gets basically sent to an application which starts the application when the phone is booted. So I would claim that these three things, this, this GPS, internet, and boot complete, uh, or startup at, at, at boot time, represents a really dangerous set of, of, of permissions. And the reason it's dangerous is that this is an example of an application that could be used as a tracker. Basically, if it, the application starts, uh, that uh, if it boots at runtime, uh, then it's always or, or at, at, at the time that you boot your phone. Um, then, it, and it has access to GPS coordinates and has access to the internet. What's going to happen is, is that it can basically just broadcast where that phone is at all times. So that's a set kind of permission that you probably want to have flagged. Or in the case of Keyring, we would simply just block installation of applications that, that had any patterns that we were uh, that were uh, a danger we refer to as dangerous. Um, so we actually did a lot, a fairly lengthy process uh, using a, uh, something we called security requirements engineering. Um, and basically we evaluated uh, using some sort of tabletop exercises, all of the different permission sets um, and different use cases and what are referred to as misuse cases. We came up with a set of a lot of different rules that say these are things that should not happen. We came out uh, we came up with about nine that, uh, permission sets that we said, you know, these should never happen. Um, and then we basically went to the Android market in January of 2009, which again is, is three or four months uh, since the introduction of Android and said at the very inception of the market, are applications asking for dangerous or unsafe sets of permission sets? Um, so we downloaded uh, the top 20 applications from the, the, uh, the major uh, categories. Um, turns out that a couple of categories that was so early in the market didn't even have 20 applications at that point, and we did an evaluation. And, and basically what we learned is, is that at the beginning of the market, we didn't really see people immediately using dangerous uh, uh, permission sets. But what we did see is a few applications where um, you had some seriously dangerous uh, uh, permission sets. For example, phone, phone state, which means um, we can record, we can, we are, the, the, the application that is notified when a phone call comes in or a phone call goes out, um, plus record a, a audio and internet and internet permissions. And really this, this kind of, this set of uh, permissions is really has the ability to eavesdrop on all of your phone calls. And so we saw this uh, in a couple applications. Some of them seem sort of quasi legit, um, uh, something like Shazam, um, uh, but, but their app, other applications made absolutely no sense. So we did find some vulnerable, uh, some, some vulnerable or, or dangerous applications at the very outset of the market. 
But perhaps what was more interesting is, is that as part of that evaluation, and this is where we get into kind of what you might be exploring uh, in, in your, your day, uh, your analysis, we did an, a broad assessment of the applications and actually the entire infrastructure and look to see if we had what's referred to as complete mediation. We look to make sure that all of the sensitive operations actually happening in Android uh, were actually protected by permissions. And we actually discovered um, that there were some interfaces uh, in, in Android uh, 1.0. And we, we, we talked to Google and they, they said they, they immediately fixed it. Um, we saw that there were some interfaces in the 1.0 that actually had uh, vulnerabilities in them. I think the most interesting one was is that um, uh, there were there was an intent that was associated with SSM, SMS received uh, that was not protected by permission, which basically meant that applications uh, could fake SMS messages uh, in the early versions of Android. But again, these are the kinds of things you can expose uh, by using some of these tools. So fast forward to 2010, um, uh, we're uh, in a world where uh, People are beginning to, uh, we've seen enormous uptake of smartphones. There's very little information about, you know, what the inherent vulnerabilities are of, of smartphone applications. And so people begin asking some, some interesting questions about, well, what exactly is going on underneath the hood? So, you know, that original question was really just about what are permissions, you know, what, what, what are permissions uh, um, where applications ask for and are those dangerous? Well, we really wanted to actually start doing some analysis of the applications themselves. And the second system, this is actually work uh, that my student, uh, Will Lank, who's now a professor at uh, North Carolina State and spearheaded by Jay Jung, who's, who's uh, in, in South Korea now. Um, they began to, to build what's called a taint tracking system. And, and a way to think about a taint tracking system is really that it's kind of a supervisory mode of, of, of an operating system or a program environment um, that basically tracks information flow through an application. And I never really have time to get into too many of the details. I'll, I'll point you to, to the paper at the bottom of the screen. But the idea is, is that if you can track information flow through applications, across applications, through interprocess controls, through the native operating system, and into, set, into storage and in and out of storage, what you can do is you can basically track uh, uh, some sensitive source like your camera, um, or your GPS and track the information as it flows through your applications, through your operating system and potentially outside of your phone. And this gives us a tool to evaluate where our data is potentially being misused by an application. Um, and so the, the resulting tool called TaintDroid uh, that was we presented at uh, OSDI in 2010 actually did this. But what was really interesting, I mean, the tool itself is, is, is fairly interesting, but the, the, the actually the study is really what kind of changed uh, uh, the way people looked at, um, at uh, uh, smartphones. Um, at the time, we didn't really know what was going on inside the applications. So we took 30 applications um, and we did this tank tracking, this information flow analysis uh, of, of the applications. Um, and we said, OK, are, are any of these applications exfiltrating potentially source uh, interesting information? Um, and we focused on things like location, GPS, microphone and camera and said, which of these applications are potentially sending the, the, the sensitive sources uh, out to the, to, the, to the network? And what we found actually was pretty shocking. And it was pretty shocking sort of internationally is we found half of the applications were sharing physical locations with ad servers. Um, basically, if you remember back in 2010, we didn't really have a good sense of what the security implications of applications were. And so what ended up happening is there was this enormous um, outpouring of interest and there was a lot of press coverage. Um, and basically, all that was sort of at a moment where we began to understand, hey, these applications have the real potential to use the interfaces of something like Android to exfiltrate data. Um, and you'll actually see in the middle of the screen, this is actually part of a, of a, of a, 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 a URL. Um, these applications, because nobody really knew what was going on, and I don't want to project any sinister motives, but, but they weren't even trying, hide to hard, uh, trying hard to hide the fact that they were actually leaking this information. Um, and we saw uh, some other things we found uh, that, that, that there were applications of the 37 were, were using uh, um, cellular identifiers and things like that, which was not really uh, kosher, not really supposed to happen. Um, 
But again, uh, coming back to our central theme here is these kinds of analyses are going to tease out new and interesting characteristics of, of, of your applications. And you're gonna be, it's gonna be really interesting when you do your kinds of analysis for something like information flow, it will tell you some non-obvious characteristics of your applications. Now to take a step back, um, we actually in, in about 2000, 2010, we realized we still weren't quite there. Um, and so we built a series of tools. These are the things that are called decompilers. Um, and uh, actually there's a, there's a fairly complex process in which applications get built um, in Android. It basically, what happens is you have a Java compiler, it, go, it creates uh, sort of very standard class files, and then you use something called the Dalvik or Art compiler, and it converts all of those Java class files to an, something called an APK, which is really just a compressed version of the Java information where it takes all of that, all of that code and condenses it down into one block. Uh, uh, that's easily, you know, transferable to a phone, um, and it's and it's it's the the actual bytecode is changed, um, and it's a, it's targeted to uh, quote unquote low power devices, um, and it's a lossy process. In fact, the type uh, the typing of uh, variables and things like that, the type uh, lattice changes. Um, it does a lot of optimization. It does a lot of compression. Um, it combines things uh, that are the things like the constant pool, which are all sort of standard uh, constant variables and things like that. And it creates one large blob. But it turns out that that requires um, a whole, if you're going to do analysis of the, uh, of, 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 of the APK, you would require brand new sets of tools uh, because it's a brand new um, a language, it's a great, a brand new set of opcodes. And so what we were able to do is build a set of tools which would reverse, which would reverse that process and take an APK um, and turn it back in uh, to the Java class files. And once you have the Java class files, if you don't know, once you have Java class files, you've got code because uh, Java has a tremendous amount of information that you can reverse all the way back to the original source code. And there's some very standard tools for actually doing this. And so we were able to build um, an infrastructure for doing decompilation. And the two tools, uh, uh, DEAD and then and DARE actually was in 2012. At, at, at the time, it was by far the best decompiler. There are, are a lot of tools, if you're ever interested in uh, 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 basically cracking open uh, an Android application, um, you, can, you can get any number of the decompilers which exist in, in, in the wild today. And that's a fairly standard approach to doing program uh, to doing analysis of Android applications. So you take your application, you decompile it, and you do static analysis. And I'll describe what that means in just a second. So, so assuming we got access to the code. Okay, so this is what we were actually able in 2011. So we built our tools, these dead and dare, um, and uh, we want to apply static analysis. So static analysis is basically um, programs which crawl over uh, app, uh, source code and look for things like dangerous functionality, vulnerabilities, um, bugs, um, what have you. But there's a whole field of computer science which is basically in static analysis. But what we did is we took a step back and said, well, gee, 2011, um, no one knows we have access to the source code. We've got one shot of this. So we spent about six months building a set of applications, um, uh, downloading a, a set of applications, um, in building a set of static analysis uh, 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 tests. So uh, September 1, 2010, we collected the top 1,100 applications out of the, uh, the Google market, um, and we decompiled all of them uh, uh, to the best of our ability. And we had about 94% of the classes, and about 99% uh, we were able to, 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 to retarget. Uh, but in the end, we were able to get the vast majority of source code um, uh, for the applications in the top of 1100 at a given point in time, which is about 21 million lines of code, um, which is a huge amount of code. But then we actually did a bunch of analyses. Um, we actually worked with a company called Fortify, uh, which, which um, was enormously instrumental in making this study happen. They, they were ex exceptionally, they build, uh, for, if you don't know, Fortify is a company that, that builds uh, uh, industrial grade static analysis tools for uh, safety, security, and correctness. Um, so they were they were provided a tremendous amount of help to us. But basically, what we did is we um, uh, built a, uh, about fifty different tests to try to evaluate what is the state of security in the Android market 
as of 2010. And we ask ourselves, well, you know, what are the kinds of problems we're actually going to see? Uh, uh, abusive telephony services, basically, are, are, they're abusing a network. Uh, we, do we see kind of uh, exfiltration? Uh, do we see bad password management? All of these tests, and, and, and I'll point you to the paper to look at all of the different tests, but all of these things sort of came together to, to, to create, to the best of our ability, a fairly broad, horizontal view of security vulnerabilities that were in the Android market at that time. And what we found was really interesting. Um, so we found that uh, the 1,100 applications, 246 of them were accessing phone information. And what was interesting about that is, is that most of them really didn't have a, a, that legit a reason to actually be able or, or to they didn't really have a strong reason why they needed access to phone identifiers. Um, basically, a lot of applications are just using phone identifiers as proxies, uh, uh, as you know, quasi cookies for for their applications. They really wanted to pinpoint which phone had a particular access, uh, had a particular um, uh, 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 application on it, and when the application ran time and time again, they would use the phone identifiers to make sure you know uh, that it was the same uh, the same platform. And 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 so you know that really um, is a misuse of phone identifiers. I think uh, uh, I've spent a fair bit of time in the cellular community, um, and I think people would would agree that that's probably not a great use of of, of, of the phone identifiers. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about mm, probably that should not be happening. Um, but what was more interesting, perhaps, is, is that we started seeing of, of those applications, 33 of them were actually leaking those phone identifiers out to the, to the, to the world. Rather than just using them a cookie in a local sense, they were actually uh, sending it across the network. And now you're starting to get into that space where it has the potential to be a hardware tracker. Um, we also saw some more general, just general, straight up tracking behavior. Um, uh, uh, and, and just so you know, these, these code snippets are things that were actually in, uh, uh, these are actually code that we extracted from, from the, the 1100 applications. Um, we, started, we started seeing connections between hardware identifiers and real-world identifiers and pseudo-identities. And now we're starting to see what we see, you know, sort of very prevalent on the net is you start seeing these, these horizontal views of people. Um, uh, what I mean by that is, is that we start seeing our real identity connected to uh, several different versions of our on online identity. And that this doesn't uh, impact you simply with an application, but once those horizontal identities are started connecting, we can now see behavior. Uh, you have somebody who has the ability to see what you're doing across multiple applications. And in, in reality, um, once you start connecting all of this personal information and, and hardware identifiers, um, you can now not only start tracking somebody within a, within a phone, but uh, start knowing the difference between uh, or, or being able to track them from their phone to their desktop to their uh, laptop. And now you're starting to get a very, very detailed view of, of people's behavior. Um, we actually, this IMEI is a hardware identifier, uh, 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 it's a mobile equipment identifier, uh, uh, that's that's connected to the phone here, and now that's you can see that's connected with a login. Um, and again, this is starting to connect all of your pieces of private information together. Um, we also saw some other interesting characteristics, and one was actually probing for permission. So, and this is perhaps one of the most um, interesting parts of the study for us is you know if you're writing an application and you uh, uh, are the one assigning the permissions, you would not have any need to probe for permissions because you know a priori whether or not you have that permission. Well, it turns out that the applications just began uh, showing up and we saw applications were starting to probe for them. And so what's the implication here? Well, now we're starting to see code in applications uh, that do not, that were written, that code was written without knowing what application it was going to be in later. And sort of the standard way to think about this is, is this is kind of like a library. But what's more interesting about probing for permissions is, is that if, it's, if you have an application that's probing for permissions, um, it's probably doing so in a way that's not cognizant um, or the application is not cognizant of it. Um, so he's, often you see these kinds of probing behaviors on third-party li uh, third libraries. For example, there are not lots of libraries you can use for gaming, uh, for electronic commerce, um, and any number of other uh, activities. And what 
if you have a, a piece of malware that's inside an application uh, that's probing for permissions, what it's doing is it's just saying, oh, which permissions does the, this application have um, and how can I abuse them? Um, we also found that, that the trend of having uh, uh, ad analytic libraries was just explosive. Um, uh, basically, half of, uh, over half of the applications of those 1100 in 2010 had uh, uh, one or more analytic libraries that were potentially leaking information, um, uh, uh, including personal information and phone identifiers to third party networks. Uh, what surprised us was the number of applications were uh, had many different uh, 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 um, uh, libraries. Um, so basically the library, these libraries are ways for people who are developing applications to monetize their effort. And so in some sense, of course, that's kosher, but uh, now you have an application which was spraying, in one case, uh, to eight, uh, uh, some information to eight different uh, 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 providers, uh, which is uh, perhaps a fairly serious uh, uh, violation of people's privacy. Now, what we didn't find in 2010 and 2011 was really what was malware. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I think there's a lot of, uh, been a lot of discussion in the community why we didn't see it there. And we have seen increasingly more malware in uh, mobile applications, um, but not, not to the degree that we see in desktops. And I think a large part of that is um, uh, due to the fact that it's, it's, it's become more and more difficult or it's, it's, not clear how to monetize that malware in, in the same ways we've been able to, to see malware monetized on, on desktops. Um, that's obviously gonna change, and I think today we see more malware. Um, um, I think we see less malware in certain markets. I think Google Play Market is probably about, uh, is, is clean. I'm not endorsing any market, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they have a lot of infrastructure, which incidentally looks a lot like some of the analysis we do um, although it's it's there, it's a little bit opaque on on what uh, uh, Google is doing. Uh, they're doing uh, uh, analysis on the front end uh, before applications enter the market and blocking sort of obvious uh, uh, malicious behavior. Other markets are less aggressive or have less in, uh, sophisticated infrastructure, and so uh, your mileage may vary. May vary. But you know the reality is is that that over time we're going to see more and more malware because the the uh, uh, the, the, the adversary is going to become more and more innovative in how they monetize uh, that malware. So you know this has been just kind of a real flyby. So there's um, a handful of other papers here, um, uh, 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 a handful of other tools that we have developed to do very interesting kinds of analyses. Uh, things like uh, ICC intercomponent intercompo communication analysis, um, uh, some new flow problems. There's lots of interesting tools that have come out of this community. Um, at the bottom of the screen, I'll point you to an SOK. So if you don't know, an SOK is a scientization of knowledge, systemization of knowledge, I'm sorry, um, uh, which basically is kind of a survey of different uh, tools and analyses over time. So if you want to get a sense of uh, the tools and analyses and discoveries that we've made over the last 10 years, and perhaps to, to, to give you some inspiration on the kinds of analyses that you want to do, I think that's a good place to actually start. Now, I know I'm, I'm running a little uh, along here, but uh, let me just, just take you know, 60 seconds to, to talk about what we need to solve in, in, this, in the, the mobile community. Um, what are the technical challenges? Um, I, I tend to think of this as, you know, I'm an academic and I say, here are the, here are the next set of dissertations. Um, basically, I think one of, the, one of the, and this is true not just of mobile systems, but uh, security in the large, there is a renaissance in program analysis. Program analysis uh, has the best chance of, of, of making substantial contributions to improving security and software. Um, there are very few other approaches that are going to make any difference. Um, I, that's, that's perhaps an overstatement. There, there are very few uh, 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 other approaches that will have nearly the impact that uh, improved program analysis uh, will uh, provide. But we also have an interesting challenge is, is that we also need to make that program analysis scale up to markets. You know, uh, your markets are seeing hundreds of thousands of applications a year, millions of applications a year. We need to be able to take program analysis and make it stronger and faster. Um, and this is going to require a lot of new science. Um, but it's also going to require a lot of innovation. And the people that make some fundamental discoveries and fun develop the fundamental tools 
um, uh, are going to be able to build really strong uh, uh, companies from them. Um, other problems are uh, we have a lot of code that's floating around in different applications and we need to be able to identify it. Uh, we have lots of libraries based on applications. We need to be able to identify and isolate them. Um, we need to identify privacy. Um, uh, we need to uh, uh, enforce our privacy disclosures. A lot of applications say things about privacy, but it's not clear that they actually follow them. Um, I think there's other, there's other challenges. Um, I think uh, uh, there's been a loss of control over our phones. Uh, I think the, the, the mobile carriers uh, have a tendency to uh, overreach and put lots of things on applications on phones that, that we don't want on those applications. Um, and I think we need to build better operating systems to allow some more balance between uh, the needs of the user versus the needs of the carriers. Um, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, we need to ask some important questions about basic usability. Um, you know, basically, we, we have these phones and they're asking us complex questions. They say, should I allow this application uh, to use these permissions? And that's a incomplete question because these applications don't they don't say the important question is for what um and the vast majority of users even if you told them for what they wouldn't have any idea of what you were talking about because you you know most of the people i, I assume are sitting uh, uh watching this this presentation are are engineers or or or, or people of science but but there are lots of the users who have absolutely no concept of how these devices are they're they're magic and, and until we can make the user, the, the decisions that we're giving them framed in cognitive models that they can understand um, and, and actually make informed decisions about, then, then the kinds of security questions we're asking them are, are sort of a waste of time. Um, so this is the new world. Um, you know, applications markets are out there. Um, we just need to get better in doing analysis. And hopefully this, this talk has, has helped you understand what the scope of some of these, these tools are um, and maybe, again, driven you to some inspiration about the new kinds of analyses uh, that you can develop uh, in your domains that are going to be market changers. So with that, um, I'll stop right here um, and uh, uh, head over and take some questions. Okay, somebody just asked, do you recommend any tools for dynamic analysis of Android applications that give debugger-like functionality? So, so um, I think there's 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 a lot of answers to that question. I I I, I can't sort of give you an exactly one application. Um, what I think the best approach um, is to start with some 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 of the uh, the surveys in the area. Um, there are new tools um, every day, and there isn't one size fits all. Um, I think it really depends on the kind of analyses you want to do. Um, I would point you to things like the survey is, is a good point, uh, starting point. Um, also, there's some really good tools out there, uh, uh, commercial grade tools for doing uh, analyses, and they have some nice presentations on kind of the scope of what they can do. It's, it's, there, there, there is no one best tool uh, because each security analysis is different in its own way. Um, second question is, what do you think about facial recognition on the iPhone? Um, well, I think, you know, to the degree that any kind of facial recognition is uh, a solid um, approach to authentication, I don't think there's uh, any additional limitations. iPhone's extraordinarily uh, uh, powerful uh, on, uh, uh, on pieces of hardware. I think they're, to, to, you know, just as a, as a, as a, as a point of uh, engineering, I think facial recognition is, is, is uh, uh, completely uh, appropriate. Um, for the kinds of authentication that you're actually doing. I think it's every bit as strong as the kind of uh, a passcode that you're doing now. Um, so I, I don't really see any, any real limitations of, of facial recognition on, on iPhone. What is the survey? Um, the survey is, um, it's a systemization model. So it's S-O-K. Um, if you go to patrickmcdaniel.org, uh, there is a, there's a publication page and just search for S-O-K. Um, that's systemization of knowledge, um, and it's about Appified and markets. All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate uh, you taking the time. Uh, thanks so much, uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, cybersecurity event.